Let us look back to the portion we have read. And we have read in the letter of Paul to Titus in chapter 3, and let us now center our attention particularly in words we find in verses 5 through to 7 in their context. Not by works of righteousness which we have done, but according to his mercy he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost, which he shed on us abundantly through Jesus Christ our Saviour, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. Well, you notice there's a trunk statement here, a central statement made in these verses. And that central statement is, he saved us. And we want to look at the portions that surround that verse to realize some of the marks and spots that belong to those who are the saved children of God. And we want to look at this portion tonight, therefore, as follows. The basis of our salvation. And notice how that is put, first of all, negatively, not by works of righteousness which we have done. And then it's put positively. He saved us according to his mercy. And then secondly, we want to look at the purpose for which he saved his people. And you see that particularly in verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. And that's the way we want to look at this passage tonight then, these two main headings, the basis of our salvation, negatively and positively, and then secondly, the purpose for our salvation, in that order. First, then, the basis of our salvation. Well, negatively, not by works of righteousness which we have done. We contributed nothing of our own to that salvation, but our sin and the disgrace and shame of our sin. The glory must belong entirely to God in Christ. not by works of righteousness which we have done, because we have no works of righteousness of our own to contribute to the salvation. Notice how Paul describes our character before our salvation. Verse 3, for we ourselves were also sometimes foolish, disobedient, deceived, serving diverse lusts and pleasures, living in malice and envy, hateful and hating one another. And some might say, oh no, I was never like that. But this is the record that God gives of us outside of Christ. In a state of total depravity, sin touching and affecting every faculty of our being. Not yet in absolute depravity. That will come when we, when the, if, we, if we remain out of Christ and may the Lord in his mercy avert such but if that were to happen, we would pass into hell and into absolute depravity. And you may, some might say, oh, I'm not as bad as, as that record. 
I know some people are, and they show kindness to their neighbors and so on. They're not hateful of one another. But that is the restraining grace of God. If the volcano of sin and evil that is in our hearts were allowed full vent, if the Lord were not to, if the Lord were to cease to restrain that, if the volcano were allowed to come out in full vent, we would be in a lost hell. But it is there. The evil is there. And we bring nothing of our own by which we can commend ourselves to him. And that is, applies to our lives before we come to Christ. And it applies to our lives after we come to Christ. We bring nothing of our own with which we can commend ourselves there either. There must be works of righteousness as debtors to the grace of God in the life of the believer. But we cannot say that that earns salvation for us. It's not meritorious in itself. Not by works of righteousness which we have done. And then positively he comes to it, but according to his mercy he saved us. That's the basis of our salvation. The mercy, on the basis of his mercy. Now, mercy, that is a, a great topic. The mercy of God is hidden in the depths of his own nature and essence. There is that mercy which is akin to the grace of God. It's like Siamese twins, they go together. The fall brought mankind into a state of sin and misery. Sin and misery. The grace of God looks to us in our sin. It bestows upon us what we don't of ourselves deserve. The mercy of God looks upon us in our misery and it withholds from us what we do deserve. But hidden in the being of God himself. And it would remain hidden but for the fact that God reveals himself. It is infinite. It is eternal and changeable. It is mercy abundant in the nature of God. But not only is it hidden, it is revealed. It is expressed. The Lord speaks it to us in his truth. And especially in the one who is the truth. Shows it to us in his word. And in the one who is the word made flesh. That's why the text says. Or what goes before our text says. But after that the kindness and love of God our saviour toward men appeared. It appeared. It was revealed, it was expressed. God uttered his kindness to us that would have remained hidden otherwise in the giving of his own son, in the miracle of the incarnation and in the completeness of that atoning sacrifice of Calvary's cross. And the one who has risen triumphant over sin, death and Satan in the one who is ascended, in the one who is enthroned, a prince and a saviour. It's there that the mercy of God is revealed. It's there that God utters his mercy. It's there that he expresses his mercy. And on there it is known, also fully. 
God was in Christ reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. It is it, it was it it was hidden, but for the fact that it is he God Himself reveals it, God Himself expresses it in His own Son. And it is also bestowed. Mercy is bestowed. It is given. But when it is given, it is given sovereignly. Although mercy is there, hidden in the being of God, in the bestowing of that mercy, it is not bestowed upon all those who were in a state of misery, sin and misery. It's not bestowed on all mankind. It is bestowed sovereignly. God says in the letter to the Romans, I will have mercy on those whom, on whom I will have mercy. Sovereignly in that respect. It is bestowed miraculously. It's bestowed miraculously first and foremost, as we read here in the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. That is of God. It's an, act it's an act of God. Taking place in the subconscious of the sinner. Whereby the Spirit of God unites himself to our spirit. Whereby the seed of life is planted where there was nothing but death. Notice it's spoken of as the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. The washing of regeneration speaks of the cleansing that takes place in the heart of that sinner. Spirit of the seed of God, the seed of holy life is implanted. And I would understand by the washing of regeneration, the cleansing that is there in that moment. Perfect cleansing in its essence, but not yet in its degree. That will require a process of sanctification, but nevertheless, perfect in its essence, that cleansing. And that cleansing, I leave this with you, but I would understand it, and it is my view, and I'm therefore leaving it with you to, to consider yourselves, the cleansing taking place by giving to that soul in which the washing of regeneration takes place a hatred of sin, a turning away from sin. The washing has that essence in it. But also notice the washing of regeneration, the cleansing of regeneration from the filthiness of sin, in its, that in its essence, not yet in degree, but it said that. But also the renewing of the Holy Ghost, there must be some purpose for the two terms being used, the washing and renewing. Surely the renewing has something to do with new desire being implanted in that heart. A new desire to serve God that was not there before, a desire to serve God out of a sense of indebtedness to what the Lord has done for me. The words of Ezekiel, chapter 
chapter 36 and verses 26 and 27 would seem to me to indicate that that is so. A new heart will I give you, and a new spirit will I put within you. And I will take away the stony heart, the filth, as it were, the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you a heart of flesh. And then the desire, and I will put my spirit within you and cause you desire to go in a different direction. So, the miracle of regeneration that is all of God, spirit, coming into that heart and implanting the seed of life where there was death, that by the miracle of regeneration in its two aspects of cleansing, hatred of sin being implanted and renewing, especially the desire. Well, that desire that is twofold, desire to serve, to keep the law, but as out of a sense of indebtedness and a desire to know him and to worship him, whom to know is life eternal. So the mercy of God then in its hiddenness and then in its expression or revelation in Christ and then the bestowing miraculously sovereignly and miraculously upon the one who is the receiver. And then there's the receiving of the mercy. The receiving of the mercy. And this is of the Spirit of God who has come into that heart, who has come into that soul. Right, regeneration is an act of God's free grace. But out of that act, there flows a process. Out of that hatred of sin will come repentance. Out of that desire after holiness will come a thrust after holiness and sanctification. And the Holy Spirit is given abundantly and richly, not niggardly, on the part of God. And it's the Holy Spirit working in that passion, even at the moment of regeneration itself, all the graces of God are latent in that heart, latent in that act of regeneration. But there is a process that will bring them into outward consciousness. Faith is latent in that heart of regeneration, but the realization of it consciously comes when we are enabled by the Spirit through the truth to lean the weight of our never dying soul security on the passion and the finished work of Christ. When we entrust by his enabling the care of our soul into the hands of the Lord Jesus Christ. And there we receive consciously receive by faith all the blessings that have been purchased through the atoning blood of Christ for his people. They come into our possession. Secondly, the purpose the purpose for our salvation. That being, verse 7, that being justified by his grace, we should be made heirs according to the hope of eternal life. 
when we are saved, we are justified. Justified by faith in Jesus Christ. Faith unites us to the Christ who saves. And the Christ who saves justifies us through the instrumentality of faith. And when we have united to Christ by faith, God, the judge in heaven, looking upon us with the righteousness of Christ put to our account, faith unites us to the Christ who saves, and the righteousness of Christ is put to our account then. And God from heaven is the judge looking upon us with that righteousness imputed to us, declares us to be acquitted from guilt and to have entitlement to reward, justified by grace. It's a declaration on the part of God. It's an objective act. We must close in with Christ by faith but faith is nevertheless, as I've tried to explain, I think, the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's a spirit who leads us and enables us to lean the weight of our soul security on Christ. And once we have that right weight, once we are united to Christ, the righteousness of Christ is put to our account, and God from heaven declares us through that righteousness, to be acquitted of guilt, declares us to be just of, to be declared to be free of all guilt, declares us to be forgiven of all sin, past, present, and future, and um, we have entitlement at that moment to eternal reward. The title deeds of heaven are put in the hand of that person who is unable to close in with Christ by faith. And if the title deeds of heaven are put in your hands, you are an heir. You are an heir of glory. And notice how that is given to us. That being justified by faith, we should be made heirs. That happens, we are made heirs when we close in with Christ. When God declares us to be righteous and to be acquitted of guilt, he also declares us through that justification to be, to have title to, to have the title deeds of heaven and to be heirs of God. That happens at the very moment of our coming to faith in Christ. Standing of the believer is amazing through, unit, through union with Christ. But then there's, the purpose goes beyond what happens at that moment. And notice it says, according to the hope of eternal life. And that hope of eternal life seems to me anyway to speak of the future. Not just the present uh, blessings, but the future that must be there. Hope looks to what is yet to be. We are heirs, but we're not yet in possession of, of, the, of, of the inheritance. We're not yet in full possession of the inheritance. The inheritance Eternal life has begun, we are heirs, but we're not yet in the full possession of that, that life. I think you can say that. And the hope must be accompanied, the hope of possessing, full possessing of that eternal life that hope will be accompanied with 
obedience. That hope must be marked with a character of striving after holiness because nothing unclean, nothing unholy can enter into the full possession of that eternal life. The whole process of sanctification must involve obedience. It must involve a growth in holiness. It must involve a character being formed that would fit us for the full enjoyment of heaven into which nothing unclean can enter. Notice that the justification is all of God. Yes, we must believe, but it's the gift of God nevertheless. It's our responsibility, but it's a gift of God. Justification is all of God. Sanctification, on the other hand, involves the sinner, the believer now, being a partner with God. He is to work out to salvation with fear and trembling, but nevertheless knowing that it's God who works in him to will and to do. And to that extent, he's a partner with God. We must be engaged as debtors to the grace of God, striving after holiness, striving after sanctification, his completeness. The believer must be marked with that. Marks of grace that we look at here tonight, just among many others, we can notice first and foremost salvation, as I hope we've pointed out at the beginning, and as the scripture points out to us, is all of God. We contribute nothing of our own but our sin and its disgrace. But salvation must also be marked with a striving after holiness as debtors to what the Lord has done for us. Justification has to do with our standing before God. It's perfect the moment we close in with Christ. Sanctification is to do with our character. And there's to be a development in that character. There's to be a process in this sanctification, an ongoingness in this sanctification. A life of holiness that the believer must strive after. Not to put God in his debt, no, no, but as a debtor to what the Lord has done for his soul. Display. What more couldst thou have done for us than that which thou hast done, giving thine only begotten Son to take our nature into union with his own divine passion, and in that nature to bring forth the righteousness which another has put it, the righteousness which thine own righteousness requires of thee to require of us, And we thank thee that he has done just that, that he could say it is finished. All the righteousness required of us in Adam before he fell, all the righteousness required of us in Adam having fallen, all the precepts and obedience to the commands and precepts of thy law, and the bearing of that penalty that is our due, For in the day that thou eatest thereof, thou hast said, thou shalt surely die. And we thank thee that it is in him that our standing must be made perfect. Receiving him in our nothingness and demerit, leaning upon him for all the blessings for his own passion and the blessings in him, for the good of our souls. And it's in him that we must have that character formed that would fit us for heaven. 
The title deeds are good, but what is the use of the title deed if we don't have the character that would fit us for the enjoyment of heaven? Oh, that thou would help us then to seek after not only the standing that is ours in Christ, but the sanctification, the cleansing of character, the holiness of character that would fit us for the house of many mansions into which nothing unclean can enter. We thank thee that in this we are not set a warring at our own charges. We thank thee that um, though we must work out our salvation, our sanctification with fear and trembling, nevertheless it is thou who workest in us to will and to do of thy good pleasure. Help us to be dependent upon thy spirit. Help us that we might be led unto Christ and find there all the blessings that we need. And help us there in him to know thee as our Father which art in heaven, guiding us and directing us. Committed in thyself to do us nothing to, but good, to make all things work together for our ultimate good and thy glory. Receive us with the pardon of our sins, which are many. In Jesus' name, amen. Let us stand to hear the Lord's benediction. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit, the Comforter, rest on and remain with you. Amen. <laughs>